What is going on, data nerds? Welcome back to another video with me, Ben Rogachon, aka The Seattle Data Guy. I, after a long weekend, am finally getting off my lazy butt and putting together the real first video for building your first data engineering project. The problem here is the more I started like diving into this project, the more angles I was kind of coming at it from. You know, if you just watched my previous video on the data engineering roadmap, you would have noticed that there's a ton of stuff that you can cover in terms of data engineering. And that's kind of where I was running into, where it was like, going down an angle of data modeling and going down an angle of like what technology to use. And it was really just killing the vibe. And uh, so I'm just realizing I just need to start or I never will make this video. So let's get into coding your first data engineering project. Wait, you're not just gonna start without developing some sort of project plan, right? What do you mean? I was just gonna go straight into the code. Um, there's not much to plan, right? Look, we're not data scientists or data analysts. We don't just get to do ad hoc analysis where we don't necessarily need to put a huge plan together because the work that we're doing is often focused on answering a question for the moment and maybe not developing some sort of infrastructure that needs to last for years to come. We're data engineers. And although there might be some title bloat in there, you know, the term engineer might be a little bit of overkill, we are still developing pieces of infrastructure that need to last arguably for years to come. So just diving into a project isn't the way we should be going. You know, this isn't some sort of quick analysis that can be written up that just to answer a temporary question. This is some sort of component or data infrastructure that needs to last for years so that future data analysts and data scientists can use it continually and continue to rely on it. So it really requires some robust planning before we even jump into coding. We need to think about all the assumptions, the use cases, why people are gonna use this data, how they're gonna use it, how often we need to pull it. There's just so many questions we need to answer before you can even get started coding. So why don't we take a moment to pause and dive into that first. Here, let me show you guys. Before diving into any coding, it's important to kind of lay out the plan of what we're gonna actually be doing, especially as data engineers, where we actually take what we build and have other people rely on it as essentially infrastructure. As systems that data scientists and data analysts rely upon every day for up-to-date data, as well as information that they rely upon to be high quality, accurate, robust in terms of the system wise, they expect it to show up at a certain time every day and all of these other things where just simply doing ad hoc analysis isn't sufficient. We actually need to do a lot more than just build a query. We need to build an entire system that runs and that requires a little bit of planning. So just to start out with this for our first data engineering project, let's just have a very high level objective here, which is basically the purpose of this project is to create a tool similar to Nerd Wallet's tool. So I'm gonna actually jump over to Nerd Wallet and look at their tool that they have and that they're offering to us. And so this is Nerd Wallet's cost of living calculator. Basically all it is, is it gives you a lot of different information in terms of salary and how much you'd have to make in another place to make the same salary that you might be making, like in this case in San Francisco. Um, if you're making 150K, you're going to have to make likely 110K in Los Angeles. Or if you were in, let's say, Seattle, you could make 119K um, in order to have the same essentially life experience. In addition, on top of that, they also have other numbers that come from other data sources that include things like housing costs, transportation costs, food costs, entertainment costs, all of which they are pulling from various data sources. And so this is kind of why I consider this a data engineering project, so to speak. When we scroll down below, you'll see that they actually reference all the places that they're getting a lot of these sources. And we're going to do something similar in our project where we're going to reference a lot of the places that we are getting our data from, because that allows people to either replicate the same work that we're doing, or at least understand why they should rely upon this data. So we're going to do something similar, but I like this because I think it's a good example of almost a data engineering project in itself. Because you can see what they've done is they've aggregated a lot of data sources into one final product, which is kind of one of the things I consider a data product. It might be a dashboard. It might be something similar to this, where you've just aggregated a lot of data and created some sort of tool to help either in this case, future prospects figure out where they want to live based on cost of living and other metrics or it could be something that helps managers make better decisions. It could also be something like a data API or something of that nature, all of which create some sort of data product. So that's what we're gonna be looking to build over these next few videos. And thank you so much for all your patience. I imagine you'll still have to wait as I'm slowly putting these videos out. It takes a lot of time to put together more technical videos because I feel like you have to cover a lot more concepts. So let's kind of dive in back to the overall plan of what we're gonna be doing. So I, I put some high level requirements here, but they're pretty high level and they're just meant for me to understand, okay, what am I trying to do with this project? So I want a tool that I can 
basically cut the data in multiple ways like job state maybe some other things that I might find along the way I want some KPIs that I'm going to list below and I, I really want to be able to drill into those metrics as well so if we keep scrolling down here's some basic metrics that I've put together I'm calling some things lifestyle metrics so as much as we think money is everything money isn't everything some people prefer living in a place like New York even though it's more expensive because it's a little more interesting whereas some people might want to live in the middle of nowhere because it's quieter or maybe it's cheaper or something of that nature but we all have different things that drive drive us in terms of lifestyle. Some of us prefer noisy cities where it's kind of action packed. Some of us prefer slower rural areas where we can, you know, enjoy a peaceful walk in nature and not see another human being for a few days. But of course there is a big notion of finance and how much money you're going to make. So finance metrics are also important. So we're going to do things like average salary, which is pretty straightforward. And then I'm going to try to do something like total time to millionaire, which is just a metric I'm going to make up basically the amount of time it takes for someone in years to go from $0 to a millionaire if they were to live in this place. So we're going to have to figure out things like expenses and things of that nature to actually calculate that because we're gonna have to think about tax food costs rental costs things of that nature so we'll have to somehow include that as well and find data sources in addition to all of the other data sources we're bringing in which brings us to the next section which is data sources and so you can use these data sources for yourself I've got a few of these one of them is an XML feed for CPI I just wanted to feed off of XML data in general because I think it's interesting to work with it can be tricky to parse for some people so might as well work with it it's also somewhat live I mean obviously it's not live to the state where there's a feed but I'm going to guess this data is updated pretty frequently so i'm curious to see i just wanted to scrape data from an xml source because i think xml data in itself is somewhat interesting and there are still plenty of sources that utilize it so i think it's worth kind of parsing in addition i'll be pulling data from this product inflation database that exists this one i think i'll just pay like i think it's like 40 bucks for this data source zilla scraping i'm going to do just more for fun more to just to show you how Obviously with scraping, it is a little bit gray in terms of what you're allowed to scrape and what you're not. So in general, do be careful who you're scraping. Many sites don't like you to do it, but I mean, Google did it with Yelp and essentially got away with it in terms of how they benefited from it. Um, next there's walk score, and this is actually an API. So this will be, I think a little more interesting and a little more similar for a lot of people who are looking to get a lot of jobs in corporate companies where a lot of what you do is honestly scrape tons of APIs. And then um, salary data comes from the Department of Labor where we're gonna be pulling H1B data, which we've seen before in my previous video where I looked at data engineering salaries. Um, so this will be where we kind of start, I think, because it's kind of straightforward. It's just basically an Excel or CSV file. So we're just gonna hit that site, click the link, essentially download the file and parse it and pull it using like Airflow. And so those are the different sources that I'm gonna start with. I'm sure I might have a few more that as I'm going that I'll have to add in, but that's a great place to start, I think, overall. And next, you need to start defining more of like the infrastructure and objects that are going to exist in your overall system. And there's multiple reasons why this is important. And here's one of them that I want to point out, which is when you start designing tables, it gets really complex very fast. And it is very much an iterative process. Like designing table structures seems like it should be very straightforward, very simple. But how you design tables defines how your data warehouse or how your data products operate. So it's very important that you think about how you're actually putting data into these systems. For example, one of the tables I'm looking at is called like the employer, which this is going to come from the Department of Labor data. So we're basically going to create a dimension table, which I'll explain here in a second. But basically, we're going to create a dimension table for employer. But this is where we run into the first problem, which is employer has address on it. And address is kind of interesting in terms of how you should store it because address is something that can change over time, you know, whether that's customer address or whether that whether that is employer address. I assume employer address changes less frequently than customer address, but it's something that changes over time. What this means in the data modeling space is that you can't simply just replace the old data with new data. You know, you can't just say, okay, just delete all the old data and now put in this new data. That's not going to work because let's say, for example, I want to report the average salary by state. Well, if an employer was in Washington this year, but then they moved states to, let's say, California next year. Well, if I were to run a report on them in the current year, it would no longer be accurate, right? Now we would say, oh, this employer has been in California both this year and last year because we don't have the data saved anywhere or stored in such a way that's easy to access or easy to translate using queries in such a way that we can actually report on it accurately for time. You know, we're, we're losing that dimension of time. And so this is where things like slowly changing dimensions comes in, which is just a concept that we use that has multiple ways you can essentially store data to track it through time. And one of the simpler ways to do that is by having this start and then end date 
What this allows us to do is then write a query that lets us group by essentially start and end date and basically say like, okay, in 2019, they were in this date and in 2020, they're in this date. Now, truth be told, what I just told you, it could be a little more complex than that because if you think about it, it could be month to month, maybe they change it a specific month. And then you have to do some ruling in terms of like, well, what point or at what point do you consider this company in one state versus another? And that's something you'd have to do more on the business logic side and depending case to case, how you would decide that. But overall, that's why it's important to understand that data modeling and thinking about how you actually store your data is an important aspect of our work. It's why you don't just run into coding because where you need to understand what questions you're going to want to answer from this data set. Because again, if you want to answer something where it's historical, but you don't store historical information, you can't answer historical questions. Another common issue I often see is people don't realize they need some form of bridge table to connect two maybe entities or two concepts. Because in one example I like to give, let's say, for example, you have restaurants and menu items, and you want to figure out which menu items aren't ordered. But the only place you really connect this data is in a fact table, which for those of you who might be new to data modeling, a fact table is essentially just your kind of transaction table. You can think about it. If I really bring it down to its simplest terms, it's just basically the thing that tracks a lot of the transactions often or what could be boiled down to essentially transactions. So um, the simplest way to think about this is like an orders table could be a fact table or a sales table. I mean, it's not the only things. There's also things like invoice fact tables and other things that don't necessarily indicate a specific transaction, but kind of still represent some sort of instance or happening in the world of whatever entities you're dealing with. Whereas dimension tables tend to be more descriptive information. So things like employer, customer, store, those are things that might be a little more dimensional or things that you might often pivot off of for reporting purposes. But going back to our DoorDash example, if what you have is a fact table that represents orders, in this case for DoorDash, and menu items and restaurants, what happens when you want to query what items are not being ordered? If the only way to kind of connect these tables together is by joining to the fact table, you cannot answer that question because the fact table only contains what has been ordered and not what hasn't been ordered. So this question becomes difficult to answer. By restaurant, you could still technically answer the question for what items aren't ordered, but you don't necessarily know what restaurant they're connected to. So that's kind of the gap here that I'm pointing out. And so that's why it's important to put some form of planning into dimensional modeling prior to going into things. Now, another point to point out, that a lot of people will start to realize is as you start working in different data warehousing systems, dimensional modeling might not be as big of a deal. There's a certain reason we take on this form of data modeling and with modern cloud data warehouses, some of this has to be modified for various reasons, whether you can't run an update statement. So it becomes a little more challenging to run something like an insert update merge and it becomes a little more challenging to do things like slowly changing dimensions in the typical manner, or in some cases you're just going to run faster queries on very denormalized data. So some people are just building very denormalized data sets to begin with. You can kind of see a whole hodgepodge of data sets kind of coming out there, but I still think it's important to understand why we use data modeling and why it's important to continue to at least implement some of the ideas and concepts that have existed for a long time and still honestly provide a lot of benefits in terms of making our data warehouses or whatever you want to call it data platform. I've heard some people utilize these days easy to use for analysts, because I think that's the biggest thing you as a data engineer need to understand when we're building these products, we're often not building them for us. We're often building these for the analysts, data scientists, product managers, people who aren't necessarily as program heavy or technical as we are, except for maybe, you know, again, data scientists, but analysts maybe know SQL and they might not know that. They might be more of like a GUI based person who uses Tableau or Power BI or something where they just do a lot of drag and dropping, all of which means that we need to create a system that is easy for anyone to come to and understand how they can pull data correctly. I want to insert in correctly so that they get the right information when they are reporting. That's why I think star schema has been so effective for so long, because it is such a simplistic way of looking at data. And even beyond that, you know, I think creating analytical layers of data where you just join all the tables is very much a normalized practice as well, just because, again, we are taking a lot of the heavy lifting out of analyst hands and letting them just be able to do what they're best at, which is analyze data. So let's just start by looking at the Department of Labor data, because I think that's a great place to start just to show you how complex even this data set is, even though it's just one file. So switching over to this data set, what you will notice is there are actually a lot of different what I would consider entities in this data set. So if you go download it, which will be linked below, you'll notice that there's a lot of information here. If you scroll over, 
you will notice that this goes all the way to CR in terms of columns. So it's got a ton of columns, you know, about 75 columns. And it starts out with things that maybe are considered a little more fact-based, which is things like this case number, the case status, things of that nature, which is a little more, again, fact-based because these are, again, not necessarily transactions, but these are kind of what you can kind of consider, not necessarily events, but they're, they're like happenings, right? Like this is a case and I would consider that more of a fact. Whereas the stuff around it, for example, let's scroll over, things like employer name are probably coming from like an employer dimension. And then of course you've got employer address that could change as well. And again, if you keep scrolling over even further, you'll see that there's somewhere over here, there's agent, which is another kind of dimensional piece of information, which you might want to report on, right? Because another way to think about this is if you're an analyst and your manager comes to you, what they're gonna often ask is, hey, can you give us the average salary by employer, by region, by agent? And so all of those are kind of separate dimensions is a way you could think about that. Uh, region will likely be part of a bigger dimension called location because you could have kind of this hierarchy where it's like maybe country, state, region, things of that nature to kind of break that down. And so you're going to realize that there's already like four or five, maybe seven tables in this one data set already. So we're going to need to spend a lot of time just parsing through this just to understand okay, what are the different data sets we need to pull from this single file? And again, this is not very complex. I think a lot of people often look for these very complex projects. Uh, you know, a lot of people look for, oh, I wanna implement Kafka. Oh, I wanna implement Spark into some sort of data pipeline. But a lot of data pipelines these days still require a lot of this kind of work where we're often pulling things from CSVs. And in fact, today I was talking to some other companies where they were actually stating that 100,000 rows or more than 100,000 rows was like very big data for them. And so everyone's at very different levels in terms of what we consider big data and what is considered complex data. So for anyone out there who's like rushing towards maybe streaming or things of that nature, I would say really get down the basics of this kind of work first. So if you're watching this video, I'm going to say go download this Excel and spend some time trying to model this data. Uh, go pick up Kimball's book. You can find a free link below, or I can put an affiliate link for myself if you really want to support the channel. But other than that, there's a free link as well below and read that book and figure out how to apply dimensional modeling to this data set. That's where I'd say start. Uh, use something like draw.io or some sort of inexpensive or free kind of entity designing tool put together a quick uh, end diagram of this, of what the different tables would look like. And that's step one, because all the other stuff, all that coding comes afterwards, you know, developing ETL comes afterwards. So don't rush into this if you don't even understand basic data modeling, because that's what's gonna feed how your ETLs work. And if you're enjoying these videos, please take a moment to smash that like button and subscribe. Again, I'm having a lot of fun developing these videos. In the next one, we're gonna take this document and just kind of push it with airflow and then maybe do some other transformations to pull out all this data. But you'll see it's really gonna mostly just require a Python operator to pull down this data. Maybe you're going to put it into an S3 bucket because you want to do it more for good practice. And then from there, push it into something like Postgres or BigQuery or something like that. And then that way you have a few steps in this ETL. And that's another concept that I like teaching with Airflow because I think Airflow kind of teaches you a lot of the concepts you'll need to think about like dependency management, logging, and other components that if you're building a Scratch system, you kind of come across naturally. Like I've definitely built my own Scratch ETL systems and you come across these things naturally. And then you come across something like Airflow and you're like, oh, I should have just been building this in Airflow the whole time rather than trying to build everything from scratch. With that guys, I just want to say thank you so much for supporting this channel. I really appreciate all your views and I will see you guys next time. Bye.